Thank you. Well, I'm going to be a little bit, I guess, a little more low key than um, than Andre. <laughs> thank you for that. Um, anyway, thank you very much for for this opportunity to address you. Um, as president of the foundation, I thought I would take a, a, a few minutes of, uh, of your time to maybe talk to you about a little bit about the foundation. I'm not, I think maybe most people know, have heard about the foundation, but I know sometimes there's a lot of confusion as to actually what we fund and how we are set up. And after I do that, I would like to maybe address some of the issues and challenges that are before us. Uh, many of them actually um, I would say are similar to some of the other thing, uh, issues and challenges that have been raised in the last two days. So just beginning, first of all, with some background information on the foundation itself. Uh, the foundation was established in 1975 by the Ukrainian-Canadian Professional and Business Federation, and we are actually one year older than Kyus. Um, so we celebrated our 40th anniversary last year. Um, we were incorporated under the federal law as a national nonprofit charitable body, and as of February 2014, we've been continued corporately under the new Canada Not for Profit Corporations Act with no changes to the aims and objectives. I mention this because the, under the new act, there have, uh, it has required us to overhaul our constitution and has some implications for some of our governing practices, which therefore then impact on how we operate. Now, the general objectives that um, were set up for the foundation was, one, to be recognized by the community, by institutions of higher education, and by government as a body that, through funding and other means, supports the development and enhancement of Ukrainian studies in Canada and elsewhere. And second, to build a base of endowed funding that consists of the foundation's general endowment fund and also of individual f endowments, the annual proceeds from which would be used to support Ukrainian studies in a perpetuity. And uh, priority is to be given to projects which initiate or expand Ukrainian studies at Canadian universities, all other considerations being equal. So just to reiterate, Foundation for Ukrainian Canadian Studies focuses first and foremost on activities that take place at the post-secondary level. Uh, there have been some exceptions in the past, and I guess it doesn't mean that there can't be any in the future, but by and large, our focus is on uh, Ukrainian studies at the post-secondary level. Now, as to the structure, the Foundation's work is guided by a national board of directors, currently comprised of 10 individuals uh, from coming from Alberta, Manitoba, Ontario, and Quebec. We do have several vacancies to fill. Normally, we would have people from some of the other provinces as well. Um, I probably would like, to, uh, well, historically, members of the board were drawn from the ranks of the professional business uh, federations. And this began to change in the late 90s um, as local chapters of the uh, professional business clubs either became less active or began to redefine themselves or to move in a different direction. So most of the current members of the board, though active and very prominent in the Ukrainian-Canadian community, are not necessarily uh, members of the uh, P's and B's. And that's another issue that comes up when we are recruiting four members for, uh, for the uh, foundation. Um, in addition, uh, and this was um, to the elected board members, until recently we used to also have three ex officio members who sat on our board. And these were the director of Kyus, uh, the director of the, um, or the president of the Ukrainian Canadian Professional Federation, and for a certain, uh, during the time of the publication of the Encyclopedia of Ukraine, the editor of the Encyclopedia of Ukraine. And, but under this new uh, not for profit corporations act, ex officio positions have been disallowed, and we are now in the process of exploring different um, ways to incorporate academic guidance, possibly through an academic advisory committee attached to, to uh, the foundation. And um, I'd like at this point just to actually to thank uh, Professor Frank Sisson for his years of invaluable service as proxy for the Kyus director. He has served for many years coming to all of our meetings, and his service has really been invaluable. Um, uh, the executive committee is responsible for day-to-day -day activities. We are primarily, as I guess most foundations, uh, comprised of all, I mean, all board members serve as volunteers. 
Uh, no one receives any financial compensation for their time uh, other than travel expenses to annual board meetings. And I mention all these things because um, very often people want to donate money. They like to know, you know how the, p the foundation operates. So we are very professionally managed. We have audited statements, comprehensive records, all minutes, uh, all meetings are very, uh, are minuted. Um, and uh, in other words, very transparent. We do have a website, uh, perhaps not yet as energetic and maybe as interactive as yours, but we will get there. Uh, but we d it does have all the information about our various programs. <coughs> so uh, the head office is currently in Toronto, where it has been since the 90s. Previously, the head office was in Edmonton, Vancouver, and in Winnipeg, uh, depending where the presidents were. And I'm happy to say that Mr. Savarin was one of the early presidents of the, um, of the foundation. So was, we have, uh, you know, this left a legacy. Uh, in terms of our net assets, um, as of the end of December uh, 2015, um, our assets were under $3 million. And this does not include the 300,000 plus that we have transferred in over the last 20 years to Canadian universities to take advantage of matching fund programs. And I'll speak to that a bit later. So of this $3 million that we have, 40% uh, of our funds have come from larger or major donors. And these were used to establish funds that in most cases sort of carries the name of that donor. But 60% of the funds come from the more modest donations, which range from anywhere from you know, $50 to, to $1,000 that have been collected over the years. And virtually all of the donors, be they major or modest, however, were of modest means. This echoes what Bishop Guzio had said earlier that about our chairs and institutions being founded and built by simple, hardworking people in the community who believe in education, have a sense of mission, and respond with passion. And that fact has never been forgotten by the successive boards of the foundation. It has always been front and center when key financial and other decisions were made and continue to be made. So of this three million, um, it, uh, how is it broken down? We have 13 programs or funds, all of which, except for two, are restricted or designated for specific purposes. And the designations were made by the donors who would have set them up. Uh, and in all cases, uh, all of the programs, be they designated or not, are for the mo most part endowed, meaning we can only disburse the earned annual income. And both of these conditions present challenges or issues that I will be addressing shortly. Uh, in addition to the funds that we hold and manage, uh, there were four other funds that we used to hold, but which we transferred to universities to take advantage of matching funds programs. One went to the University of Toronto, two went to the University of Alberta, and one to the University of Victoria. And these transfers involved substantial funds. In each case, uh, well, in three cases, it was $100,000. Uh, and um, each of these situations presented us with some learning experiences, which I also will bring up shortly. Um, so while there are obvious benefits to those arrangements where we transfer funds to the universities in order for matching funds, there have also been some challenges. So um, a few words now on how much the foundation has dispersed over the years. So since its creation in 1975, the foundation has disbursed close to three and a half million dollars in grants. On average, that would be about eighty-seven thousand dollars per year. Although, in uh, probably we disbursed less in the earlier years, but certainly if for the last five years since 2011, we have been disbursing over a hundred thousand dollars annually each year. And last year, in 2015, we actually disbursed a record one hundred twenty-five thousand, the highest amount to date. Now, what has been supported uh, with, uh, by, with all this money? So I'm happy to say that in spite of program restrictions or designations, th there has been a really wide diversity of projects and activities that have been supported, uh, and they're wide-ranging. Various academic press publications, academic conferences or symposia, public as well as more student-oriented lectures and seminars, academic exchanges, scholarships, fellowships, library collections, teaching of new university level courses, 
research activities, and distribution of educational films. We were, um, the foundation was the primary financial supporter of the Encyclopedia of Ukraine, and now continues to support in a, signif in a significant way the Internet Encyclopedia of Ukraine. In terms of geographical or institutional diversity, over the years, the foundation has supported activities and scholars at pretty well every university in Canada where U Ukrainian studies take place. Now, it is true that projects and scholars at the University of Alberta and at the University of Toronto have been beneficiaries more frequently and have received possibly close to 60% or maybe more of all of the distributed funds. Now, and this is not surprising since the majority of the funds that, um, that we have are targeted or are tied to specific programs at these two universities. We also have two funds that are designated to support activities at the Kyiv Mohyla Academy and at the Ostrok Academy National Universities in Ukraine. Uh, but other than that, all of our pretty well funds are directed at activities in, in Canada. So, um, you know, looking at all of this, uh, we can say that the foundation has definitely been fulfilling its mandate uh, and at quality levels. However, we are also facing issues and challenges and not in any order of priority. And some of the things that I'm going to mention have actually come up uh, on earlier panels. Um, the first one is matching existing funds, the ones we have, with new and emerging needs and various incoming requests. As I've mentioned, most of our program funds um, are designated. They support existing programs or activities at universities or specific scholarships. This means we have next to no flexibility to address new priorities, new needs with the existing funds that we have, and that's the, some of the things that we've heard from the other panelists, uh, and, and priorities are shifting. So um, it also means we also have little discretionary funds for small one-off projects, a seminar, a visiting lecturer, a small publication, a student scholarship, something that doesn't fit into what we have. Um, at the same time, um, on the other side, we have actually a couple of designator programs, uh, and both of them deal with the field of communications and journalism, that in recent years, we've actually had difficulties attracting qualified candidates. And there are different reasons for this, which um, I can go into later. But what it means is that those funds have been sitting idle um, when there are no qualified candidates, but yet we can't redirect the funds towards other purposes because there are signed agreements and we need to respect them. So we are currently reviewing other aspects of those programs to see what can be modified or tweaked or looked at maybe different ways uh, you know, of uh, implementing these programs. Uh, so that it brings up the issue that was mentioned uh, the other day by Professor Marples and I think and others as well the need perhaps for less restrictive or more open terms of agreement. However, um, when um, the reason why many donors are so specific, uh, and I'm talking about the ones that have approached us, is because they feel that the particular area that they would like to fund is one that is not being addressed by um, academics or may not be sufficiently addressed, and they feel that their fund may somehow encourage work in a certain direction. So you get sort of the two. On the one hand, we would like something less restrictive. On the other hand, people feel that s there are gaps that need to be filled, and that's why they're giving the money for that. Okay. Uh, so the answer we we're looking at whether maybe w the next thing, we need to build short-term specificities into our terms of agreement or allow for periodic reviews and updates. Um, the next question is, should all funds be endowed? Endowed funds, as you know, we can only spend the earned income. You can't touch the capital. But we've asked ourselves, when there are pressing needs, does it make sense to always safeguard the capital? And there have been times when we have uh, actually dipped into our endowment fund beyond the earned income in order to respond to, uh, to a need that has, come, uh, that, uh, that has been presented. Um, another um, one is monitoring, um, and I mentioned that we had transferred some funds to uh, universities. One would usually think that once you've transferred, you don't have to worry about that anymore. But we have learned uh, from experience that you need to continue monitoring the management and the status of funds that are transferred to universities. 
Um, to give you, I'll give t uh, two examples. Um, we have, uh, there's the, um, the Clark uh, Graduate Fellowship in liter la Ukrainian Language and Literature at the University of Toronto. And for 20 years, there has been no problem in the way it has been dispersed. It has gone to the, the, you know, the most qualified student. And then suddenly last year, we were told that there's a residency requirement. Uh, unless you're an Ontario student, you cannot, uh, an Ontario resident, you cannot qualify for that uh, fellowship. Um, and um, this, without my going into all the details, um, it, you know, this, this, this went into many meetings, looking through files, pulling out old documents, uh, this, you know, discovering that certain documents were missing. But all this to say is, in the end, I mean, we do have happy news to report. I mean, we did get, after all of that, the university has agreed to waive from now on all residency requirements uh, so that as long as the student is qualified and is recommended by the, by the uh, Professor uh, Kaznarski and, and, and his, uh, or his colleague, they will get the, that, that fellowship. But had that, um, um, let's say, had we been not been monitoring it as closely, those things sometimes can slip. And then what would have happened is that if you, because most of the, many of the students who are coming in and are uh, getting that fellowship are from Ukraine, and not all of them qualify, are Ontario residents, then they would not qualify for that fellowship. Um, the other one is the uh, Struk Fund um, that we have transferred to the University of Alberta um, with the promise that we would, there would have been matching funds. And um, we are waiting, well, to date we have not yet heard anything uh, from the University of Alberta. And, uh, you know, I've heard informally that, that the matching funds program has been closed. But that's, again, kind of, you know, something that needs to be followed up. Um, the redirect clauses, we've learned that you have to be very specific, that in the event of a program ceases to exist, that the university will not only on its own uh, redi redirect the funds, but will consult back with the original donor. If you don't put that in, they have the freedom to redirect, even though they say that it will be in the spirit of what was intended. The spirit may be defined differently. Um, so, um, I know I think I'm running out of time here. Um, raising new dollars is also a challenge for us. Uh, when we fundraise, to tell you the truth, we are not getting a fantastic, like fundraising in general, um, a great response. It's always, it is the same people, but the, those donors are literally dying off. Uh, they're being replaced very slowly, but not it to the same, you know, at the same rate. And there are, you know, we hear different reasons why younger people are not um, um, prepared to, to, to donate or to support. And I guess those are some of the topics that we need at some point to sit down and discuss with people in, in the, um, um, at the universities who are, because very often that's what some of the people say, well, I don't see what I believe should be happening. Um, what are the priorities? Um, uh, too much attention being focused on Ukraine. We want Ukrainian Canadian uh, research or diaspora research, and then you have the reverse. So there, are, there was all kinds of things happening or discussions taking place at the community level, and we need to find some good way to bridge that uh, between what is needed, you know, so that people feel that there is they are getting a good return on their investments. Um, the last challenge is is really is an internal one for us, but it is important because uh, the um, uh, foundation has now been around for 41 years, uh, and we hopefully we'll have you know another longer future. But we need to look at the board composition, and and we um, are challenged. We need to look at drawing um, different skills from the ones that perhaps we've had in the past. Um, people perhaps with a greater emphasis on marketing, communications, governance knowledge, uh, to be able to help us to meet the new challenges that are out there in, the, in order to be able to draw on uh, the, um, to, to get more financial support. In closing, I would like to reiterate, reiterate what Professor Lupel had alluded to uh, or in his mar remarks, introductory remarks uh, the other day, that Ukrainian studies are not like other academic studies. They are not independent of the community that made them possible, that nurtured them through difficult times. This does not mean that the community does not believe in or respect academic freedom, but it does have an expectation for a return on its investment. And the relationship is a delicate balancing of interests. 
And I'm reminded of this whenever I read old foundation minutes, the minutes of the board meetings from the 70s, the 80s, and the 90s, the debates, the discussions that are recorded in considerable detail in those minutes all bear testimony to the passion, the sense of mission, and the dedication that has always driven this foundation. So I feel that as uh, CIUS celebrates its 40th and we are 40, 41st, this is indeed an opportune time for us to review our successes and our disappointments and to see how we can work together to meet the new challenges so that you know, some of the, the problems that have been identified here, in fact, we will be able at least to provide some of the, I guess, the financial support to ensure that you know, the um, Ukrainian studies does have a long and prosperous future. Thank you.